Hello. Great to see you all here tonight. My name is Jason King. I am Dean of the USC Thornton School of Music and co-producer of Pop Conference. Thank you for being here on International Women's Day, which should be every day. So welcome to keynote number two. Uh, once we announced that we were going to do this conference this year, and that the theme in its 22nd year was going to be legacies, uh, archives, and collections, um, I got a lot of emails. And uh, one of the emails that came in was from Timothy Ann Burnside, one of the first ones. And she said, legacies, archives, collections? This is my whole world. I have to be part of it. Um, and I thought that was great. I thought it was really important to have a keynote event that would highlight the work that a museum curator, archivist, specialist would do and have the kind of conversation that they might have with an artist in music. And so I wanted to illuminate that relationship as part of what we do here at Pop Conference on the keynote itself. So Timothy, Ann, and I put our heads together and a lot of this was her idea and I was just there to support. And so that's where the idea came from for tonight. So, without further ado, I'm going to introduce our guests for this second keynote of the Pop Conference 2024. Timothy Ann Burnside is a... Oh, come on. Good applause, yeah. He's a curatorial specialist at the Smithsonian National Museum of African American History and Culture. Her work uh, explores intersections between history and culture through the lenses of music and performing arts, through the acquisition, research, and interpretation of material culture. Uh, to me, the National Museum of African American History and Culture is one of the great experiences at a museum anywhere um, in the way that it brilliantly illuminates the history and the culture of black music. Timothy has more than 20 years of experience at the Smithsonian. In addition to curatorial work and exhibition development, uh, her background includes archival work, collections management, exhibition installation, and program production. She's produced and contributed to diverse award-winning projects like the Smithsonian Folklife Festival, Rhythm and Blues, Tell It Like It Is, the museum's grand opening festival, Freedom Sounds, a community celebration, and the incredible, incredible Smithsonian anthology of hip hop in rap. Plus the museum's newest exhibition, Afrofuturism, a history of black futures. And our keynote guest tonight. So in 1980, after Gail Chapman left Prince's touring band, Lisa Coleman stepped in on keyboards and piano. Prince invited Wendy Melvoin into the band and then renamed it The Revolution. And they recorded an album that a few people in this room have probably heard of. It was called Purple Rain. <laughs> That's how Wendy and Lisa started their careers in one of the most successful rock bands of the 1980s, Prince and the Revolution. Y'all know the albums, Purple Rain, Around the World in a Day, Parade, a little bit on Sign of the Times, Planet Earth later on. Uh, the Revolution Band was a multiracial, multigender marvel. And Wendy and Lisa didn't just play with Prince, but helped transform his sound, his approach, while also transforming the way that we think about the power and the role of women in music and the possibilities for women as genius instrumentalists, songwriters, producers, and so much more. They released five albums of original material as a duo, Wendy and Lisa, 1987 on Columbia. That's my jam, y'all. I had that on cassette. Come to the sideshow, come get your mind blown. Uh, Fruit at the Bottom uh, on Virgin in 1989, Eroica 1990, their remix album with The Orb and William Orbit and Nellie Hooper, um, Girl Bros, 1998, uh, White Flags of Winter Chimneys, They've also scored so many feature films and television shows from Dangerous Minds in 1995, Firefly Lane, Cruel Summer, Touch, Nurse Jackie, the list goes on and on. They've won uh, Emmys, Grammys, Oscars. Wendy and Lisa, to me, are some of the MVPs of popular music in terms of their session work and the songs that they've written with a who's who in popular music. And I'll just read a few of the names on the list. Seal, 
Joni Mitchell, Terrence Trent Darby, Katie Lang, Lisa Marie Presley, Michael Penn, Grace Jones, Tricky, Cheryl Crow, Rob Thomas, Gritty Politti, Madonna, Nina Gordon, uh, Nika Costa, uh, Andre Simone, Eric Clapton, Betty Lovett, Mac Miller, Walk the Moon. That is literally just a sampling. So without further ado, at the 2024 Pop Conference, let's welcome Timothy Ann Burnside, Wendy Melvoin, and Lisa Coleman. Well, hello. Hi. Hey, hey, Wendy. Hey, Lisa. Hi, Timothy. Hi, hello. How are you doing? Doesn't she have a great name? Timothy. <laughs> My name um, is Lisa Thee. <laughs> I am so excited to be at the PopCon for, I don't know, 12th, 13th, 12th, 13th year or so. Um, and it's so great to have it here at USC. So welcome to all the students in the audience. Thank you for joining us, um, and to the, the loyal, loyal PopCon goers, welcome as well, and to new friends here tonight for the first time. Happy to have you here. Um, I am so excited, y'all. Like, I, they, they were teasing me because I have color-coded pages of notes. Um, there is too much content for this conversation, um, but we're going to make it work. Um, and we're going to hear some music along the way and just share some memories and really talk about what we've been really kind of throwing around in our really hilarious group chat uh, for the past week or so is the theme with the conference being legacy and story, co conversations around collections, archives, which is, happens to me my whole life. Um, how are we using the sonic memories? How are we placing these moments in a, in a song and sometimes in an object? And how do those then be kind of the keepers of those feelings, of those memories, and how do we channel them out again to share with the world? And so there are a couple of really amazing um, things to highlight, of course, from, I, where, where do you even start, honestly? Well, we're gonna start in LA. Um, so we're gonna do a little walkthrough of these incredible chapters because what's so amazing about um, Lisa and Wendy is not only are they legacy artists themselves, they come from legacy. They come from a musical, two musical families. Um, their parents, uh, their fathers in particular, of course, um, with the Wrecking Crew. And so I was wondering if while I'm plugging in my iPad, um, you could just share with us that those very beginning moments for you in terms of being constantly surrounded by music. Lisa, you talked about your dad's studio and when you got a synthesizer, how your brain exploded because um, it wasn't just tape. Um, and what that did for you to prepare you for what was to come. Well, okay. <laughs> Let me tell you. <laughs> Um, yeah, my, my parents were both musicians. My mother was a jazz singer um, in the clubs when she was like 16. She lied about her age and she got a gig. But my dad was the pro, pro musician and um, he, and there's so much to say about it. He um, used to take me to the studio with him sometimes and I got to go to a Jackson 5 record date one time. and. I think that they were recording I'll Be There, which was really amazing to hear that song. Now I always flash back to being at the studio. I was like nine years old or something. And um, I think what it did for us in a lot of ways was kind of normalize that life. That was just our life. That was really normal, in, especially in this town. It's like our greatest output here is our imaginations, music and film and dance and all of that stuff. So growing up here really helped um, prepare us for the life we were about to lead. Uh, 
She's correct. <laughs> Yeah. Nailed it. Uh, Nailed it, Lisa. <laughs> yeah. It, that's exactly what it did. It prepared me to be comfortable in the role of a young musician in the world. I was 19 when we went on tour with Purple Rain, and I wasn't um, flustered or rattled by it. I was used to that kind of environment as a kid. And there were a lot of musicians around all the time that were great musicians. I have a very strong memory of me and Lisa very young. I think I was eight, and Lisa might have been 11. And our parents were having one of these parties that they had, and there were a lot of great musicians there. Leon Russell and all the LA Express, which was Joni Mitchell's band, and. Uh, Mad Dogs and Englishmen, you know, the Joe Cocker band. It was like a crazy group of people. And um, there was a jam happening in the living room, and Max Bennett, the bass player from Joni's band, put up the bass in my hand, and Leon Russell sat next to Lisa and said, come and sit down next to me. And we just started jamming with these guys as, as very young kids, right? And I have a very strong memory of it. So we were sort of positioned at a very young age to kind of make it happen. Yeah, yeah I, I love that your families are so close. You know, you've known, literally known each other your entire lives. And um, I'd like to share a little deep cut with y'all tonight. Um, who's familiar with the band or the group Waldorf Salad? Anyone, anyone here? Okay, okay, like Why? Four. Why? How? Why, why? <laughs> of course you would. <laughs> so uh, there's this little group, um, and literally little, because they are all children. It is the combination of the two families. You're not, don't worry, you're not going to see it. Don't worry. <laughs> I saw. Mm. Um, and they, they, put out a, they put out a single. They put out a single. It's called Look you at... Call well, yeah. It's called Look at the Children. Oh, God. So we're going to hear... <laughs> Would you like to set this up, Lisa, at all, or just no? Yeah, go for it. I don't know. It was written by grown-ups that we used to call grups, and they made us sing, look at the children, like, as if we weren't children. It was kind of <laughs> really strange. <laughs> it was the attempt at a pseudo-partridge family moment, so here, we'll just, we're just going to get a little bit. That's it. We're not going to do a whole lot. The selling point? was that everybody played their instruments. And that's what our fathers were like. But these kids really played their instruments. Did not help the selling point at all. <laughs> Look, at Lisa's legs started going. She's like, Ugh. But I think what you were doing also is a really interesting thing, is that you saw how her body reacted immediately. It is still in her brain. It is still programmed in there, whether she likes it or not, I think. Um, so talking about all of that and talking about, um, you know, the evolution from childhood into high school and realizing like, yeah, music is like a thing I, I want to do. I want to jump to about 1980. My note literally, 1980, Lisa goes to Minneapolis. Um, so you get this opportunity to go play with these weirdo musicians in Minneapolis and Wendy is still here in LA. And so I'd like us to kind of set the stage for what's happening on both, well, not coasts necessarily, but middle of the country and on the West Coast. So Lisa, if you could talk a bit about how in the world did you even end up in Minneapolis, Minnesota? Yeah, that's what's so funny is, you know, I just talked about growing up here in LA and Hollywood and my dad and the music business and all that stuff that was right at my fingertips but I ended up moving to Minneapolis to join Prince's band. He was looking for a girl keyboard player. And so I checked both boxes. Happy Women's Day. Oh yes, happy <laughs> International Women's Day. There we go. We planned that, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so um, yeah, it was just a friend of mine uh, from junior high actually worked she ran away from home at an early age. It's all very dramatic. And she got a job working as a secretary for Prince's management company. 
And so when he was looking for the girl keyboard player, she thought of me and um, I gave, I made a tape and sent it to him and it was his birthday when he got it. So I said, happy birthday at the end of the tape. And I think that's, that's what sold it. That was what got me the gig. Over the edge. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, could you also just share a little bit about your audition and the infamous, oh. I just started playing the piano. Yes. Well, um, Prince picked me up at the airport and <laughs> I guess he thought I was like this, you know, he's like, oh my God, she's this big hippie. You are. <laughs> It's just the hair. <laughs> and um, he was on the phone with his girlfriend. Was like, but wait, Rrr. you're missing so much. He, pick, he picked her up in a, a little... Well, yeah, yeah, the car is important here. Yeah, yeah. I mean, he picked her up in his little Fiat. Prince drove a Fiat. And she, in, wait, in and then Minneapolis, she, Minnesota. Right. And then she let, lit a cigarette in his car. Didn't you? Yeah, I did, and he was not into that at all. <laughs> but uh, so right now you're like oh for one. Yeah, I yeah. mean it was just uh, everything was stacked against me, and and we got to his house, and um, he pointed down the stairs. <laughs> he didn't even speak to me at that point. <laughs> I was just like, mm. <laughs> so I went downstairs, and there was a piano right there at the bottom of the stairs, and. Prince went um, to call his manager and say, I don't think this is going to work. Um, get her a plane ticket back. <laughs> but then he heard me playing the piano downstairs. I kind of whipped out my best Mozart or something, and he heard it, and he was like, well, wait a minute. <laughs> and so he hung up the phone and came downstairs, and we started jamming, and... And the rest is history. And that was that. And then you, he's sleeping on the couch, and you're just coexisting in this really interesting way. Exactly. Yeah. 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 So then, meanwhile, Wendy's out here in LA. She goes to. You, you were. Were you of age, Wendy? At no. this point? No. No. My twin sister and I used to sneak out when we were 13 and 14 and go to a nightclub here in Los Angeles. And, and for anyone who's of a certain age, will know a place called the Starwood. Do you know the Starwood? You know the Starwood. It was on the corner of Crescent Heights and Santa Monica Boulevard, and in the front was an actual stage where bands would play, and in the back, there was the disco. So on this one particular night, we were at the disco, and the pretenders were playing in the front room. Oh, wow. And I hear this song come Ooh, can on. can I play it? So here you okay, are. Okay, that's, that's a serious sense memory for me. Yeah. It started everything. Mm -hmm. When I heard that on the dance floor, I ran up to the DJ and I said, who's that woman? <laughs> who's that girl? Where can I get this, where can I get this record? I didn't I know. I need her 13. name. And he said, he said, it's not a woman, it's a 16-year-old kid from Minneapolis, Prince. And I, I, I couldn't believe what I was hearing. I couldn't believe it. So I did my deep dive, became a complete disciple at that point on that first record. And then cut two, I'm spending my last year of high school back east. And I get a phone call that Lisa got hired to go play with Prince. And I, what was your first thought? <laughs> my first thought this. is, holy shit, does she know who she's playing with? And what was your answer to yourself? She has no idea. <laughs> she has no idea who this guy is. It's true. I was a classical nerd. Yeah, I, I mean, she no was like idea. playing Hindemith and, you know, and <laughs> I'm like, you know, listening to Soft and Wet and I'm like... And then I fly home that summer, and she's come back, and she has a little cassette tape. And we're at the Coleman's house. She has a little cassette tape, and she says, this is what I just did when I went to Minneapolis. And she puts it on. Do you want to play the track? Which one out of the... 
I have the two. I have, Cabeza? I have, I have well, I have... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, here, fun fact. Um, both Lisa and Wendy make their debut on Prince Records as vocalists. They're just singing. Lisa, did you actually play any keyboards and it's not recredited, or did you only sing, like, for real, for real? No, that was, that, that was in the beginning. Just, yeah, okay. Just, sing. just wanted to make sure, because you never know. We'll find that out later. Um, so, so here you are, <laughs> contributing to this amazing body of work already that we are starting to get to know with Prince, and then here comes the uh, 1999 record. But meanwhile... Again, I, I'm, I'm, it's hard to speed through these moments, but Wendy's origin story, of course, with the group um, and how she became to be only credited as Wendy, again, for vocals um, on this beautiful song called Free. So if you could talk, Wendy, um, how it came to be that you were on that record and then here you are, oh look, I'm in the band. I mean, briefly, I know you've told this story a million times and we already talked about what we're not going to do during yeah, this Yeah, but talk. it's very interesting because maybe you can help me with the timeline here. Was controversy after? Before. No, it was before. Before. So yeah. Des was gone mm -hmm. after 1999. Okay, so... Um, my origin story is sort of romantic in, in nature, and that is that after the two of us grew up together, I spent my last four years of high school away from the Coleman family, and when I came back, I was a, a mature young lady who had gone through um, her hormonal change, and I fell in love with her. And um, we had a relationship for about 21 years as a couple. And I went to go visit her in New, New York City during one of the Christmas breaks. And um, I was practicing my guitar in the hotel room. And Prince was walking through the hallway and he heard music coming from Lisa's room, which did not make sense to him. And he knocked on the door and he came in. And he said, who's, who's playing? And I reluctantly said, not really reluctantly, but, you know, I, I said, that's me, I'm just practicing. And he said, would you please play me something? And I, um, I, I you know, in that moment, you have to understand that I, I was, like, playing back my whole, like, life and the moment at the Starwood and and listening to the cassette of head and like going, what is happening here? And then being in this moment where he says, play me something. And I was like, what do I play this man? And interestingly enough, I just realized this as an adult woman now is that I played him um, the opening chords to Dom Juan's Reckless Daughter, which was a Joni Mitchell record. And when I was a very small kid, I didn't know that she open-tuned her guitars. So I learned how to play all of those tunes in standard tuning for anyone who knows that. So my hands have ended up, if you can see this, <laughs> being like, they're like starfish. So I mean, my fingers can really stretch on it. So I, that, I was like, I, I'll just play in that. And it's just interesting because I played in that and then years later at the Joni Mitchell um, concert that we just did with her in, at the Gorge in Washington, I, I was saying, you know, like, it, 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 everything is because of her. And that it was the, that moment playing Don Juan's Reckless Daughter for Prince and his eyes just got huge that he soon thereafter called me on the phone and said, would you join the band? But he asked Lisa first, which was really sweet. Oh, so that do you is. mind if we ask your girlfriend to join the band? Yeah. Which is really Look nice. at him. I know. I think it's interesting that there is a, that this is a whole other conversation or a paper for anyone out there. There is a really incredible through line of Joni Mitchell throughout this entire narrative. Yeah. Lisa talked about turning Prince on to Joni Mitchell. There's a story about she surprised you at a birthday party 
and now here you are, you know, able to perform with her and be part of this really interesting collective. We saw each other at her birthday party this past year. That's right. We sure did. Um, so that's a, I think that's an interesting through line, you know, the way that a musician like Joni Mitchell reaches so many different elements. Yeah, all of, three of us yeah, of, were and, connected and now, to her and that pop way. music, period, in, in a way that you might not expect. Yeah. So, again, anyone wants to write a paper, the content is there. Um, so, here we go, I guess, in, in this really amazing chapter of your lives, I think, and for all of the consumers of what was happening in Minneapolis at this time. Um, we get to August 3rd, 1983, at First Avenue. Oh. Yeah, we're, we're gonna jump on the timeline just a little bit here and there to save time. Um, and I think that there are two songs, I, we, I wish we could play the entirety of all these records. Two songs that I think are different ways of how the world was introduced to you two. But this, the, the other element to this, and this is kind of more uh, Wendy's world, um, is that, well first, could you talk about your choice of instrument at this time? You're playing, if I'm not mistaken, a Rickenbacker 330. Um, Prince is playing his signature maple Mad honer. Cat. Yeah, the Mad Cat yeah. honer. Yeah, which is the holy grail for me of guitars. Not any of the 30 plus copies I, he made. I completely agree. The actual one that, that's broken yep. right now and, and has been broken for years. Mm -hmm. So talk about that decision, I think, uh, because it's really interesting how you frame that choice sonically. I, I can't take credit for that. Oh, but you, you could, we wouldn't know. I can't, it, no, see. <laughs> it was my idea. It was Lisa, <laughs> Lisa it was me. Uh, there were a bunch of guitars delivered to the, to the to rehearsal, and Prince looked at that and said, why don't you play that? And I said, okay. okay. And that's really all it was. Now, we modified it and made it sound like it could handle being in front of massive side fills, because uh, usually uh, Rick and Packers have you know, F-holes, and they're open, and you know, they'll feed back if you crank it too much, right? So we filled the holes and we changed the pickups and, you know, I, I made the, the, the action just a little bit better for me because they're really kind of soft action and very narrow little necks. But the sound, you know, I was, I, I you know, again, I was a, a, a Joni fanatic, so I was listening to all these records where she's tracked acoustic guitars 5,000 times, and it sounds like it's a chorus. Yeah. Hence, the 80s chorus pedal. <laughs> so I would use a lot of the chorus pedal mm -hmm. in the 80s because of that sound. Mm -hmm. So I think for a lot of casual listeners to the Purple Rain record, they may have assumed that this was actually Prince. So that is one of the most iconic introductions to a song of all time. Clearly. Thank you. Didn't Joni ask you what tuning you were using? Yeah, Joni asked me, she said, what tuning are you in? I'm like, not. I just, I'm getting like, and that's excited the thing. for you. I wasn't, I was in standard tuning and all those chords sound really big and fat and they're really low on the neck, but my, again, my hand is like stretched to what's on, you know, the ninths, and yeah. that's what I did, and that's why yeah. it sounded that way. And I think that, so prior to that moment, so of course we all know they tape at First Ave, it becomes, some of it becomes the live songs on the record, yeah. et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. History is made. Um, I think that, What's interesting about the creative process getting up to that point, Lisa, you said at one point, Prince didn't mind a cheap guitar with cheap pickups. He'd just turn it up and get the best out of it. And I think that there's this DIY element to the revolution. And um, oh my, we haven't even talked about the rehearsals and the da, 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 da. No, not enough time. But so there's, there's that happening where it's like, we're going to make this be the best that it can be. But there's also this element to the recording process, because Wendy, you said that everything Prince recorded, he always had the mind to think of how it would be translated live. So you weren't making anything in the studio that you could not then perform. 
And so I think it's a really interesting way of thinking about how you were crafting these moments, these songs, to exist in this form, yeah. but at the same time to exist in live performance. And so simultaneously you're creating op two different opportunities for people to then create their memories around those songs. Because I guarantee you, anyone who is around at the time of the Purple Rain tour in particular will tell you that is their most amazing live music experience ever. That is, that is their favorite concert of all time, if you were lucky enough to be in one of those rooms. Um, and so I think that that's something that will get to you know, your solo careers as well as, and as a duo, but that I've, I've heard you talk about how you kind of carried that on. Like, we're not gonna try to do too much. I mean, his philosophy really worked, for, especially for that era, because we were trying to be a rock and roll band. We were a rock and roll band. So we didn't like double, triple track things, you know? There were two keyboard parts. It was Matt and Bobby, I mean, Matt and Lisa, and there was a drummer, and there was a guitar player, or two guitar players, and a bass player. And sometimes we'd have percussion, and sometimes we'd have a horn. But they would come on stage with us. And um, yeah, that was the whole point, is to be able to recreate the records perfectly live. Yeah, so speaking of live, um, another iconic introduction. Um, so the Syracuse show that was taped for a live album and, and on video. So here you are, you're what, six months in to this yeah. tour? This is the la almost the last shows, maybe you have three or something like that after this, and you have been playing around the world nonstop, go hard all the time. And now here you're doing this show and oh, guess what? Video cameras. It's being recorded for an album, like no pressure, right? Um, so you've, what is your mindset in that moment as you're like, okay, so here we are, we've been doing this for a minute and now we've got to do it elevated or did you approach it like it's just another show? Where were you in your apartment, Lisa? Her apartment, by the way, is um, the space at and behind her keyboards. That's her apartment. Yeah, and that was my apartment. I had a little throw rug, an ashtray, because I was a smoker, but I'm not anymore. Um, um, like, did you walk into that concert being like, oh, it's another show on the tour, or was it like, oh shit, we really need to... Well, it was a combination, because we were so locked in at that point as a band, and we were you know, playing every day and going crazy and doing that. And, um, but this was a special thing, and not only was it being recorded, it was um, satellite to Simulcast. Germany. Oh, that's right. and the, and it to, was to being, Europe. Yeah, so it was being broadcast like, in a lot of places. So we were a little bit nervous, but Prince especially wanted to make it a, you know, something mm -hmm something different, something special. So it was literally at sound check that day, we added a bunch of stuff to the show and Prince added the, this whole thing with you and Mark going up on the side fill and watching this big screen of, that was... Wendy's the, clearly blocked this from her memory. <laughs> She's no, like, I, I, remember I don't remember it. it. I remember it. Do you remember that? I do, I remember it. Yeah, I think it was designed so that Prince could do a, a costume change. Yeah, definitely. We yeah. always had little and interludes tracks. in that. So this is also um, a recently remastered project that was released, but I think that, again, one of these intros, um, and I, I just want to play this because I think it's really important to note that people in the audience don't even see prints for the first 30, 45 seconds at, at least. Lisa, the quote that I wrote down is, we played everything really fast that night. <laughs> was everything just a little bit faster? Um, I, for whatever reason, but I think like, that's not a surprising or, or like abnormal thing with the energy, but you remembering like everything was elevated. And Wendy, one of the, my favorite ways that you framed that was that the, the whole performance was like a book and each song was a chapter and you had to go through them. Yeah, yeah, it, it, yeah, that's exactly what it was like. And, and, and on that, that night particularly, it was like, sometimes the audience was so loud that your ears would distort. Right, you remember that? Yeah. It was crazy. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah. 
Thanks for the help. <laughs> I was turning into yes, the, Remember girl. that time you were in the revolution? <laughs> right, right. That was cool. <laughs> that was really cool. You guys remember you were in that band that one time? Um, <laughs> We were joking, that's what we were not gonna do tonight. Um, Cause it's so easy to just be like, yeah, that was cool. Um, so let's go to around the world in a day. I um, quickly just, the division of labor around that album and the, the actual sessions for that song in particular. Anything, anything interesting that you could maybe share from, from those moments? Well, I mean, it was really interesting because our brothers became involved. Um, they were musicians and, and here and always recording and doing things. And they sent us a tape of a couple of their new songs. And one of them was Around the World in a Day. And we said, Prince, you got to hear this song. We brought him out to my car, which had really cool stereo. Not and a Fiat. Right. Not, a Not a Fiat. Yeah. 1964 Mercury Montclair, salmon Ooh. color. Fancy. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so we went into my car and put the tape on, and he heard that chorus, and he just, like, freaked out, and he's like, when can your brother be here? And, you know, um, and my brother was a very interesting in, um, musician, uh, he has since passed. Both of our brothers have passed away. Um, that's another strange thing that we share in, in our life. But um, my brother taught himself to speak Arabic, and he had fallen in love with the Lebanese girl, and he taught himself to speak Arabic from a book. It was amazing. And he got into Middle Eastern music, and he played the oud and the darbuka, and he played, like, Middle Eastern cello, and so that um, sound of around the world in the day was really came from my brother. The other, um, Lisa, let's just get a couple bottles of wine and I know, play some we music. Just, can we just stay here all night, y'all? You guys, can busy? we, Jason? Is that okay or no? Jason, I got the thumbs up from Jason. Great. This is literally what we do in real life, by the way, is just chat and play chat, music, play music and tell weird stories, and yeah, it's. I love these two women. They, they low-key were like, can we just adopt you? And I was like, yes, please. You have adopted me. It's official right now. We just made it official. Um, yeah, it's true. It's, there's, it's true. Um, but <clears throat> one of my favorite songs on that record, um, and it has a, a very interesting extended cut, but um, Lisa, you are not just a legend in terms of you know, keyboards and, and classical music and vocal arrangements and all of these things. Um, but your finger symbol skills. interesting Midwestern connection to this song that I have to say. So what is my entry point to all this, you may ask? You probably didn't. Um, I grew up in northern Wisconsin, and so Minneapolis was like the closest city. Four hours away, mind you. Legitimately the closest city. My little town is, uh, population right now, 600, if that. So clearly Prince was also ours. You know, we, our radio stations were coming from Duluth or Minneapolis, um, and if we needed to buy clothes for school, we would go to the thrift stores or secondhand stores um, in, in Duluth. And I, I didn't know that secondhand store was like a thing that was a reference outside of the Midwest, and maybe it wasn't, but now it is because he said it on a record. Um, so the, 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 the way that we took ownership of what was happening oh, in sure. Minneapolis, oh, sure. in Wisconsin, and throughout the Midwest, oh, yeah. what else did we, I mean, we had a lot more, but I mean, it was Prince. Um, so 
I always felt strangely connected to Raspberry Beret for that reason. I, I can't really explain it. It's very strange. Um, I felt that way about Aretha Franklin's Chain of Fools. I thought she wrote it for me when I was a little girl. I get it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I love it. Um, so we, we get into um, Parade. Um, there is one track in all of Prince's catalog where he's not singing lead vocals. Me, oh, I, I'm on really a personal level, I, On a personal level, I, 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 when, I, when I finally heard the final mix of that, I was like, it's really good, but the vocals mixed really low, Prince. So there I, is this I, I story. I oh. was like, because it's me singing, I mean, it's like, whatever, yeah. I mean, whatever. But I was just literally, it was like, the vocal's so low. And I always wonder, oh, I wonder if he did that on purpose. Well, so that's an interesting thing. That's an interesting thing. So I did phone a friend on this track. I did call our friend Amir. Shout out to Amir Questlove Thompson. Um, he has in his possession the full orchestration version that, and I'm, I'm blanking on her name, um, there's a different version of this with like 12 more layers of instruments. And then the, the, the story goes, Prince did put his vocals on and then took them off. Are you sure that wasn't wonderful ass? This is, well, we can, we can ask him because this is what he told me. Maybe he is incorrect, but he did send me a track that I can't play here for yeah. copyright reasons. Um, but I think it's, I mean, the idea that there is a singular moment in Prince's catalog where someone else is given mm. that, that position of lead vocals. It, it didn't happen before that and it has, didn't happen after. Um, it's a pretty interesting thing and also a bit of trivia that I didn't realize until well, he did, relatively recently. Didn't he do the, I mean, I think he did have, was it Rosie Gaines who sang The Most Beautiful Girl? Who sang oh, Diamonds and Pearls? Yes, sorry. Diamonds and Pearls. Oh, hey, sorry. Right. But he's still singing on the yes, track, true. so, yeah. Um, so I thought that was an interesting little yeah. bit of, of trivia. And um, yeah, there's a whole other version that I'm not allowed to play here today. Um, there's an interesting connection also to go to Mountains, one of my favorite jams on the, right? And you all did a beautiful, beautiful um, trip part. You played that as part of a tribute a couple years ago, and it was amazing. But Lisa, there's a, there's a, a story I didn't know um, that apparently the piano part from Mountains, according to you, is something that I had been playing since I was 13 years old. It has the joy of a 13-year-old. There's something about it that is kind of pure. So how did that, one, I mean, I don't wonder how it stayed in your brain because your, your brain is like that. But to have carried, again, thinking about sonic memory, to have carried that for so long, and then here it is on, on this record. I know, it's really great. I, I really like the song, uh, um, and I still play it. It's just one of those things, you know, when, when you're a musician, there are certain things that you just play, like the your go-to kind of stuff and that was always one of my go-to piano things and and it still is and so one time when Wendy and I um, were in the studio in London doing something for Prince. It I was during remember. Under the Cherry Moon and we were recording the parade record and so we flew to go finish something for him and had more time and, and cut so we, mountains. Yeah we started fooling around with mountains and he heard it and he loved it and Put and there some it was. lyrics to it, and there you go. Well, this just, is another memory. I, I, I was so lucky to be able to play in that band. <laughs> so lucky. It's a pretty incredible, I mean, for the amount of output that exists, the amount of touring that you did, the level of professionalism, the time, that for a lot of other artists would have been a span of 10 years plus. Y'all did it in three-ish. Three-ish, four-ish. Four-ish, yeah. yeah. That is astounding. And I think for um, aspiring musicians, if there are, you know, again, students or others, that level of work ethic, we hear a lot about that, and there's amazing, like, 
sort of bootleg footage of rehearsals and just like the repetition and the insistence on just every single time it's your absolute best. Um, so then in, in the late 80s, we, we shift into um, your debut record, Wendy and Lisa. And yes, absolutely, hello. Amazing. Um, and there's this interesting conversation that happens throughout not just this record, but your whole, yes! Oh yeah. I love it. Um, this whole narrative about, you, like you hear so much of Prince and Wendy and Lisa's music. And it's like, or, or did you hear Wendy and Lisa and Prince's music? Like, so you said, Wendy, that um, you said, I think we alienated a lot of hardcore Prince fans with Wendy and Lisa. Um, the idea then that fruit, fruit on the bottom, you were kind of reeling them back in. And so the, the process, again, to make an album, to do all of that without the, the person Prince was, but also the system, the structure, all of that, here you are on your own. And there are these immense expectations. There are all these common interviews where, you know, you in particular, Wendy, were like, I was always fighting because I was playing guitar as a woman. So there was that, number one. And then all of these other layers. And Lisa, you talked about how everybody expected us to be Prince but like we have our own identities as individuals and together. Yeah, it was a tough, it, it, that was a, a really remarkably tough transition for both Lisa and I because we wanted, we wanted to make an effort to not go out and sound like Prince because that would be um, disingenuous. Um, and we ended up making this first record and for whatever reason, well, it's not for whatever reason, it's very obvious now looking back on it that no one knew what to do with us. And, no, and that's unfortunately because Lisa and I are musicians and weren't really entertainers or kind of like branding ourselves. We confused our record companies. We confused people that worked with us. Like, what were we? So we kept putting out records that sounded one way and then another way, and then we'd, it, you know, our records kind of were like KCRW's Morning Becomes Eclectic. It, 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 it kind of ran the gamut of a whole bunch of different styles all the time until we were dropped from every label, and then we decided to be completely true to ourselves, and we started making weird records that no one ever heard, which is great. <laughs> well, we're going to hear them tonight. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so... On Wendy and Lisa, I have two songs queued, and you all can pick which one you want to hear. I have, what are the two songs? Everything But You or Light. It's tough. It's tough. Waterfall. I knew it! I knew she was going to say that. Um, can, you, can you share a little bit about the reception of this record and the expectation for the A, B side? Oh, was it, wasn't it Waterfall and Light? Yeah, so what, how did that trip you up a little bit? Wendy, you answer that. <laughs> Suddenly she's not talking. <laughs> what was it about that song? Um, Waterfall was actually written with Bobby Z. When the band broke up, um, we hung out with Bobby Z and tried to lick our wounds all together and you know, go in the studio. Mm -hmm. And, um, but it was like, <laughs> Waterfall became like this big thing. It was like, that, that's the hit, that's the hit. And, um, you know, we even, I remember meeting John Oates at a studio one time. He's like, don't you guys have any other songs? <laughs> <laughs> no, Jeez. we write Waterfall over and over again. Yeah, yep. <laughs> um, yeah, I, for anybody who's not done a deep dive into the, the Wendy and Lisa catalog, please do so. Um, because again, we do not have the time to get through a lot of it. But I, we're gonna veer off that path for a hot second, just really quickly, you know what's coming. Um, so in 1987, Prince released this record called Sign of the Times. Um, 
there was a bit of conversation around that release uh, regarding who was credited on said album. Um, I believe you were formally recognized for two songs, but like in a weird little small way. Um, could you, would you like to expand on um, your contributions in reality to that project? Or not, it's okay, well, either I mean, way. Most of that album had been done by the three of us, um, Prince, Wendy, and I, and Prince used to send us songs to just work on without him because he was really busy doing lots of Prince things at this point, you know, and being princely. So <laughs> we, had, we were in the dungeon doing uh, all the hard work. <laughs> And then he got mad at us. <laughs> I heard he got mad at you on occasion, but you always kind of came back to center, right? Yeah, we had... Well, you never get mad at Lisa. Oh, no, no. He got just mad me. at me once, and that was the last time. <laughs> but it was after the cigarette and the Fiat. There was another time after the... <laughs> no, right. there was another time. But I mean, the idea that here he drops this amazing, you know, album, and you had put all of this work into it, it's kind of like beyond your, getting your feelings hurt in a way, but as you kind of referenced earlier, Wendy, Prince didn't necessarily always like to recognize people. Yeah, it was, a, it, uh, you know, the part of his, the, part of the way he got mad at us was to take things away mm. like that. So that's how he, that was his way of saying, you, you know, this was the consequence of what had happened, and it was a long, sordid tale. Um, but yeah, we yeah. that that album had been completed by the three of us, mm -hmm. and when we left, it all changed. And then there was just like this, he stuck little, it to us, just twisted mm -hmm. it just a little bit. Yeah. Um, so then here you come back in '89 with "Fruit on the Bottom," though, yes. though. Um, because to be clear, they are constantly working. Constant. I'm just glad they're here tonight and not, you know, working on their EGOT. Um, all they need is a Tony, y'all. We gotta figure this out. I'm looking at someone in particular. We gotta figure this out. Um, we're just- We're working on we're it. We're working on it, right? It's just, it's just, it's a set. We want the complete set. Um, oh, can I just tell, so, sidebar. We're talking about things. We're talking about these objects that represent these major moments in time. And you know, so much of what I do in my professional life is go out to find said objects and bring them to a museum so that now over 10 million visitors at the African American History and Culture Museum, over 10 million, we went diamond, with being closed for two years during a pandemic. Um, yeah, this is wild. Someone was like, oh, who even sees your work at a museum? And I was like, <laughs> well. Um, so the, the moment that is in my, is a long story, but I, you have to just kind of catch yourselves in those moments, right? And just say, you know, people see it. People see it. Just because you don't see our names who are doing the work anywhere in the building doesn't mean the work's not happening. So... But we were in the studio, your, your studio at the, you know, legendary Jim Henson Studios, and we're doing what we're doing right now, just talking shit. And Wendy pulls out this bag of stuff, and I was like, what is happening right now? What's going on? Um, because I'm sitting on the couch, and like all their Oscars and Grammys and Emmys are like on the shelf. And she pulls out this bag of stuff, and she's like, well, there's, there's some stuff. And I was like, oh, oh, okay, like what's, and so we're going through it and then I pull out its pair of pants and she looks at me and says, yeah, those are either mine or Prince's because we shared clothes a lot because we wore the same size. <laughs> and I was like, That's, you're awfully casual about that, you know? But I had this knapsack that was, yeah. that I, me, Lisa and I like have a handful of stuff from Purple Rain mm -hmm. and I just. Yeah, oh yeah, you do. Stupidly just threw it in this bag. And it's in like a duffel bag. And we're, she's we're gonna, like, we're gonna work on this, y'all. We're working on this. <laughs> we're to rehouse, et cetera. So I think that's an example of something that, and there's another one too, that like for Wendy, it's like, oh yeah, those are some pants. 
a Prince fan may be like, can I lick them? You know, like, <laughs> it's a whole other level of um, interest. And then, um, <laughs> Lisa has me, she's like, oh, put this on. And I'm like, okay, I'm gonna put this on my Instagram tomorrow so y'all can see this moment. It's this amazing, um, I'm gonna have, I have like a running list of these images in my brain. It's this amazing long like cape that has metallic like stars and moons and it's got this hood and stuff. And she's like, yeah, you know, we had to wear these things. I'm channeling Lisa, but you know, they were really heavy and really hot and they would just get really smelly. And it was just a lot to wear all the time. And I don't even know when I wore this. And I was like, oh, okay. And I'm wearing the thing. A week and a half, maybe two weeks later, she texts us in our little, little group chat. And she's like, oh, that was from the Oscars. <laughs> oh, God. And I was like, wait. So when you went up on stage with Prince to receive an Oscar for Purple Rain, you were wearing that thing that I was then wearing. <laughs> Neat. <laughs> That's cool. Um, cool. 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 Remember that? Remember, Remember that, that time? Remember that one that time? Cool. You were in that band? <laughs> but, <laughs> but that speaks to my point. Like, for them, that's life. They've lived that. That is their existence. For me, I was like, well, it didn't smell bad, number one. It is very heavy and very warm. But also, like, that is such a major moment, you know, in, in history. And um, that's a whole other conversation, too, about the recognition that the Purple Rain Project, you know, at large received. But um, also, you know, those objects are, are kind of transferring those stories um, forward in a way. And, it was just a really weird thing, too, for me. Um, so in, in 1989, Fruit on the Bottom happens. And as you mentioned earlier, the idea that you were kind of like saying, hey, hey Prince fans, we're still here. Like, we, we, aren't, we aren't completely in a different stratosphere. Um, come back in. Come back into the fold, in a way. Um, is there, um, and then you do the, the remix, the Lolly Lolly remix that Prince does, which is an interesting trajectory also because I think there's this mythical storyline oh they were never friends and oh it was, and it's like well you always you were just constantly coming back to each other well, it was, yeah but it was a really difficult time at that point again we were struggling with our record labels and Lisa and I at the time weren't like 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 publicly out and we were still writing songs that were like oddly gendered towards men, which was it was normal. But then, on, on retrospect, with like that, there was so much that wasn't like connected to us. Yeah. So it was it was a tough time. And, and Prince actually heard some of the stuff that we were doing, and he loved it. Um, and that's how he got involved with giving us a remix to one of the songs. But, you know, it, it's funny with Prince is that you, you, you give him something and he completely changes it. It's, it's wildly There's, different. It's, it's yeah. wildly different. Yeah. Well, out of, um, I was thinking about either Tears of Joy, Are You My Baby, or Everything off of that. Ooh, I heard that response out of that record. Um, out of those three, what kind of speaks to you the most about in terms of being representative of these transitions and of that time, again, where you're, you're still fighting all these battles? That's a good question. I don't know. <laughs> Wait, or I can just, we can just pick one at random if you want to talk about one of those. <laughs> um, or not, we can just keep going. But well, I mean, it was the whole album that we were, you know, just trying to, I guess, because the first album was so eclectic, like Wendy mentioned, uh, <laughs> all of our albums are. But the, but yeah, the second album, we tried to make it more like a funk album. And um, just, we simplified a lot of things. So I don't know, really any one of those songs that you played, you could kind of hear how it's, it's more simple. So A lot of people don't realize that 
all of the records that Lisa and I do, it's just the two of us yeah. doing everything. I was just right? gonna say, like, shout out to Wendy's bass skills, also. Oh, yes. <laughs> like, <laughs> and n not only yes. that, but you know, we see all of these the greatest blank of the all time blah lists, and like, why are these two women not on those lists? Like, I don't, I don't know how many times I throw a Rolling we're Stone not magazine and like the greatest guitarist of all time, and it's like you're not there, and I just get so mad. Um, Me too. I just get so mad, you guys. Gosh. <laughs> but you have had your moments of recognition in very public ways outside of Prince, um, been featured in, in various exhibitions and mentioned in all of these, you know, books and things that I'm sure everyone in this room has has read at length have read at length. Um, so I, in order, to, in the interest of time, I do want to jump ahead to um, the more recent events and share a little bit about um, when we actually met and started to do all of these amazing things that, that we do. Um, you came to DC on the tour with the revolution very early on after Prince passed away. And I'm, I'm bringing this up for a couple of reasons. We talk about memory, and that is of course linked to loss and grief and mourning and remembrance. And there's this very interesting thing that happens when people in the, in the, the public eye at the level as a prince pass away is that there's this almost expectation that fans have to be included in moments that are incredibly private and personal. You would not ask these things of others if a family member passes or a friend passes, but because Prince is a larger than life star, I will never forget watching whatever platform of receiving information at the time, and somehow TMZ was at the gate of LAX is you're boarding a Delta flight to Minneapolis immediately after Prince's death. And they're saying, how do you feel? How do you feel? Isn't this terrible? And I just, I started crying. I just remember like, what the fuck are you doing? Like, why are you putting a camera in their face? And also, what do you think they're going to say? And so I was so impressed in that moment. This is before we had met in that moment because you, clearly had had experiences with the press before. Um, and you were very polite and just very simple and we're, we're going to go see our friends and, and you know, just that was it. And we, we're getting, literally as they're getting on the plane. And so this balancing act that you have had to do both in, as you mentioned, losing brothers and the, the Jonathan song is um, just hauntingly beautiful and so raw and so full of emotion. But the decision then to take the revolution out on the road um, as a way to heal and a way to kind of put these songs back out into the world. Again, thinking about the sonic memory and what exists in those songs for everybody because the way that people were gathered in the streets outside of First Avenue and the way that people came to the shows and the way that this, these communities gathered. Um, you created a safe space with every single show for people to go through whatever mourning process that they needed to while you were also doing the very same thing on stage. And I remember very clearly um, towards the end of, because I think you both said in different ways when asked, who will replace Prince? And the answer is nobody, absolutely no one. That's not what we're doing. And the idea that these songs are being given back. Um, and in the show in DC, again, it was really early on the, in the tour, so you're still, this was so real. Um, you got to Sometimes It Snows in April. And I remember, Wendy, you told the audience, I, I might not get through, I might not be able to do this. And you didn't. You had to stop singing. And immediately the audience picked it up and, and sang the rest of the song. I was up in the side, ball, I was, oh my gosh. That moment has lingered with me. But the idea that you had those moments night after night after night after night, 
with the fans and with yourselves? Yeah, I mean, after he died, we, we, we kept looking at each other saying, what, what can we do? What, what, can, what can we do? You know, you, uh, aside from try and bring him back to life, right? It's, a, it's, a, it's futile. It's so absolute that it's, it's unspeakably absolute. And we just decided the only way that we can get through this is if we try somehow to give the energy that we have as five members on a stage to play certain songs that would give an audience at least a taste of what that moment might have felt like, yeah. right? It was without him, no question. We did not have our master and commander, but we made it really clear to the audience that you guys have to sing this stuff because it's yours now. There will not be a prince on the stage with us. There will not be one. Yeah. It doesn't make sense. It's ridiculous. But every night we would do that and we'd feel that energy to collectively, five of us, but it was, we couldn't do a lot of it. We, I mean, it was a short tour. We did like, I don't know, maybe a year and a half, two years of it. Yeah. And then it just became like, uh, I, we, we, keep, we can't keep holding vigils. It's too much. It's taxing on it you. Was, it, it was really yeah. hard, really, and, really and hard. And to, the, uh, to the, the naysayers out there who are like, oh, they're just trying to profit off it. No, nobody made any money oh off God. that tour. <laughs> that wasn't the point. No. Yeah. It wasn't the point, and that wasn't the reality. Right. Right. When he's like, there was no check, okay? Right. Yeah. Uh, but the, I saw, I know, just like, oh. Uh, I saw three of the shows on that tour. I saw DC, and I saw Minneapolis, where you met my mom, um, at First Ave, of all places, and that was transcendent, um, absolutely. And then... <laughs> We don't have time for this story, but one day, maybe the New York show, when I surprised you with a special guest, and Wendy got so mad. She got so mad at me for bringing someone to her show. Oh my God, no, I was mad in love. Mad, madly <laughs> I mean, in love. do you want to, you can share if you want she to. She brought Andre 3000 and thought I was gonna die. And I didn't tell her and ahead I of truly, time. Truly, I mean, I'm like, he, I mean, he's my e-ticket. That's just it for me. He's the exception to the rule. Him and Q-Tip, I'd take either one of them. <laughs> we have these, so I didn't tell her he was coming to the show. And so the, what I got was afterwards, um, she's like, I was playing, playing, playing. I look up in, in, in the balcony and I see you in a mirror and I'm like, hey friends, you know, whatever. And then she's like, then later on, midway through a guitar, so I look up and there's motherfucking Andre 3000, Timothy, and I wanted to strangle you because I almost stopped playing. <laughs> and I was like, oh, sorry. But what was amazing that night too was, you know, of course, Outcast connection to, to Prince and, you know, the infamous now story that Andre is sharing about the pep talk that Prince gave him and all these things and they inducted him in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame and da 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 da. Um, we, we will in another date, maybe another PopCon, talk about the Fairlight and the disc that says Wendy and Lisa. Yeah. Andre bought a Fairlight, and with that came a disc that said Wendy and Lisa, and he bought it in LA, and it's red, and they're like, we played a red vote. And I am on a detective uh, mission for a lot of things in my career, and that is one of them. But at the end of um, the, the show, you know, there was such a mutual admiration in the room, and I for sure have pictures of Andre with Wendy and Lisa kissing him on both sides of his face. That oh, exists. yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it was really sweet. That's but, a sense memory. <laughs> I bet. I bet. <laughs> but it was such an, an, a beautiful example, too, of who really wanted to come out and not just pay their respects to Prince and honor him, but pay their respects to both of you. And I'm, I'm just truly grateful to have been a part of the journey in any capacity. I remember when you came to the museum for the first time on that tour, Years later, they shared with me that it was uh, a really important part of their grieving process was to walk through that museum and see not just Prince, but see so many others and be reminded of how people's energies and spirits and memories live on. Um, 
and that's what we do in, in, in this world. We have places where we go, like museums, these, these spaces to go and see things and be remembered and reminded, but we also do that in our personal lives, whether that's all of your guitar pedals from the 80s that you're still using, whether that's writing and, and, and putting out music for your mother on Lisa's solo project, Collage, by the way. Um, and so how we're, how we're continuing all of that is, is really important. And so on that note, you know, in terms of paying, respects and, paying respect and, and honoring, um, I'm just, I'm so grateful to have had the time to talk with y'all. We could really be here all night, but we're gonna go to questions because Jason, um, as much as he wants us to stay, we will get kicked out. Um, <laughs> yes, but we can do this again sometime, perhaps. Um, but if anyone has questions, I'm not sure how the logistics of this uh, will work. I believe there's a microphone and they may place it somewhere or they will carry it around. Yeah. Maybe it's easier to just put it somewhere and then people can walk up to it to ask your questions. If you're capable of doing that, if you're not, we will bring it to you. Um, I've, I follow your lead. Right Theater people. Thank you also to the tech crew and everybody at USC for hosting this. You all have done an amazing job. We did a whole sound check to plug in my iPad, so their attention to detail is, is really important. But So there's a microphone here, um, and we have some time for some questions. Please don't be shy. This is your chance. This is your shot. Line on up right here, and uh, go ahead and... Yes, please, please introduce yourself and ask your question. We like to know people's names. Yes, here. my name is D'Angela Duff, and I actually have a couple of questions, really quick. <laughs> First of all, um, Wendy and Lisa, the album, I saw you on that tour. I was 17 years old, you played in Atlanta, and you actually sneaked us in because we were underage. My boyfriend. Yeah, paying actually, it forward. Paying it forward. <laughs> yes. My boyfriend met you guys uh, at Tower Records where you were doing a signing, and he t told you guys that we couldn't get in, and so I have my ticket with me. But that's another thing. How much do I love that? Yeah, but the thing is, I really would love for you guys to play the Wendy and Lisa album live from the beginning to end. We, like, you didn't alienate your audience. We love that first record. It is incredible. Just FYI. I support Thank this. That's, that's, that's incredible. So my question is, why was Prince obsessed with body heat? And what do you guys think of when you hear or someone says body heat? Be flat. <laughs> really? Immediately, if I hear body heat, be flat, because that's the key we played it. <laughs> well, why, why body heat of all of James Brown songs? Like, what was it about body heat? Do you know? Because it's body heat. <laughs> <laughs> all right, thank you is. so much. <laughs> thank I you. Think just one of those grooves that he loved. Yeah. Wasn't it the? I think it because it probably had energy. Yeah. You know? yeah. yeah. And heat. Yeah. Thank you. And body. Hi. So, hi. I know this man. Hi, Chris. How's it going? Uh, D'Angelo and I actually uh, did a, a podcast about the Wendy and Lisa album for, what, the 30th anniversary? Yeah, the 30th yeah. anniversary. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. I was like, please, God, please have them perform this record. Oh, you're <laughs> such a tender button. Thank you. That's great. She's the star of the Prince Academic World, if you do not know oh, D'Angelo. She does amazing fantastic. work, amazing work. I'm gonna ask, I think, the question that I think everyone wants to know. We love how busy you are with composing and all the work you do. Will we ever get another Wendy and Lisa album with lyrics and all that stuff? Yes. yes. It's her fault. <laughs> <laughs> Because I'm ready now. I'm, like, I'm ready. <laughs> I'm ready every day. And Wendy's like, oh, I got to go. Why don't you tell them what we're up to right now? Yeah, what are you all working on? Just, you know, Just share with the people. Answering questions. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. This is what I've dealt with for how many years? <laughs> 
things literally. <laughs> Which is why we love you. <laughs> well, so can we, can we assume that there are things on the way? Are you not Yes, well, at we're, we have a really cool project that we're, we're just starting to work on right now. Um, it's the two of us uh, writing with Annie Lennox, and we're going to do a, wow. a project together. Well, that would be cool. We're trying to come up with a, a band picture, name, so if you've got any good ideas suspicious. for a band name for the three of us, it would be great. I saw you all together, and I got real suspicious. Yeah. Yeah. Well, let's go to this side. Good evening, my name is Kevin, and I'm really interested in your creative process when you're scoring and how that might be different is when you songwrite, specifically because directors want certain things. You might hear something, but the director wants something different. So I'm really interested in your approach to your, to your scoring. Oh, Great you're, question. Yeah, you're so right, because a lot of times when we're scoring, we'll start doing things that are like, that sound good, like if it was a song. And then we realize it's not really serving the scene. You gotta keep going back and watching what you're doing. Because um, we, we write pretty much in real time as we watch the scene. We go through it each time and each time. And, but then, you know, every once in a while we come up with a part and go, that, that's so great. And it's like, but Which you're you know right what? in the way of the dialogue. Yeah, it's, gotta it's go. like right on top of this whispering you know, dialogue. <laughs> <laughs> so. So that's an important thing to remember, yeah. I mean, it, it, <clears throat> specifically, the process for the two of us is so clearly different between making records and scoring. Because scoring for us is all about servicing the medium and the narrative of someone else's words, right? And making records is coming from our own place. It's out of nowhere. Mm. We're kind of coming up with the whole thing. So we're having to really facilitate a story and try and figure out how best to serve the narrative arc of a story through our music. So we, we approach scoring a lot differently than most people do. So um, like Lisa said, we do things in real time and we you know, watch scenes over and over and over and over and try and figure out exactly what needs to be pushed narratively, what needs to be pulled back emotionally so you're not slamming people over the head. So we're, we, you know, we're, we're kind of like anti-action composers where we'll, we won't necessarily want to compose something really fast and aggressive sounding when you're looking at a scene that's really fast cuts, lots of actions, lots of guns, lots of running, lots of yelling and screaming, we pull it back and kind of do it in half time and then turn it into more of a subtext to, a, to the story, right? Now, th that's not, clearly that's not the way it always goes because a director or other people in the medium will say, we want you to play to that kind of atmosphere. And that's what we do. That's where the composers, but left to our own devices, will cut that kind of thing in half and make the viewer think more psychologically about the scene than the literal scene. Mm. So that's part of the process. Thank you very much. Hi. Hi, girls. I'm Marie. Uh-huh. <laughs> I had a question about your guitars your Rickenbackers that were taken, and since we're talking about artifacts and memories, and it made me think about Paul McCartney's bass yes. that he got back recently. Yeah. Right. And it was driven by fans trying to find that bass. Yes. Have you ever thought about something like that for you your know, guitars? I, I, I thought about it. You know, my, my two Rickenbackers, my purple Rickenbackers from Purple Rain were stolen from the back of a car when we were getting ready to go on a tour. Um, many, many years ago. And I always, every once in a while, say, if anybody ever sees these things, please let me know. I think they've, like, it's been, like, it's in a chop shop or something. I, I, I can't imagine that they've survived. But if they do, I mean, yeah, I mean, it, going to the fans is an interesting idea, but, you know, I, I, I don't have high hopes. It's been so many years. I know that Paul got his bass back, but I, I don't know. I don't know. You never know, but also, you know, the idea that you would love to have it, but you've 
I had let it go. You had you had to move on, but maybe this is a crowdsourcing opportunity um, to say if anybody's seen this, call Wendy. Um, I'm going to bounce back and forth and go to this side. Hello. Hello. I'm Christopher Troy, and we have a little connection. Um, you know, I'm currently playing with Morris when Monty retired. Oh. But I have a question because I hear all these stories. Tell me who started the food fights. Oh. <laughs> Lisa will Here we know. go. Here we go. Um, it was Jerome. <laughs> <laughs> all right. I can, I can see that. Yeah, it started with one little, like, toss of an apple to, over at Bobby Z. And, um, and then it just, it turned crazy. And um, then the whole, I don't know if you know the whole story, like how they, um, Prince. I heard about the eggs. Oh, there's eggs. Yeah. But it even went deeper, like while the time was on stage, we kidnapped Jesse off the stage. <laughs> Literally took him off the stage and Prince pretended to be Jesse and went up there and played the guitar. <laughs> yeah. And so we were, I mean, we took, Poor Jesse backstage uh, and handcuffed him to the rack of the, in the dressing room, and it, it was oh my god! It, it, it was, was the '80s. It was the '80s. It was the '80s. <laughs> HR. We, we were HR. young. HR. HR. Right, right, right. Well, but if yeah. you're if you really are interested in the in the multiple perspectives of these stories, um, again, our friend Amir has this podcast called Quest Love Supreme, and he has a significantly lengthy interview with the Revolution as well as with Jimmy Jam. And they talk about the right. same moments right. in time right. Right. and right. what right. they remember and how they remember it. So that could maybe fill in some of the, the gaps for what you're, yeah. what, you're get, what you're digging for. I'm gonna go back over to this side. Hey y'all, my name is Rhonda Nicole and I have a comment and a question. Um, the comment is just me taking the opportunity to thank you very specifically for Girl Brothers. So I was just telling a friend the other day that that album reminds me of when I first moved to L.A. in 99. It reminds me of my very small apartment. And I always thought it was so beautiful and just such an interesting um, exploration of grief. And fast forward to 2009, you guys did the show at Largo, and I came from Dallas to see it. And six months later, I lost my sister. And so the album took on a very, very different meaning for me but I always reference it as just a really exquisite and beautiful exploration of grief and loss and what happens after. Yeah. So thank you. Thank you. Um, my question though, kind of has nothing to do with Prince, although everything has something to do with Prince, but I am absolutely obsessed with Alison Russell's new album and I know that you guys are on yes. it. So I just wanted to find out how you wound up working with her. She's a brilliant artist. Uh, and she's something else. when I saw you guys with her recently and I was just curious as to how that partnership mm -hmm. came to be. It was um, her husband, JT um, Nero, got in touch with me I, and I can't remember how we actually- Joe Henry. Joe Henry, yes, mm. Joe Henry, the great songwriter, producer. Um, he gave JT my contact info and he texted me and he was like, you know, I don't know if I can really even ask you this and I don't know if you'd be interested, but I'd love to have you play on my wife's record. And, you know, at first I was like, yeah, I'm sure you would, you know. <laughs> uh, who's your wife? I don't know. I, like, <laughs> no, no. no. He, he said, <laughs> uh, I'm an entertainer. <laughs> um, but he sent, he sent some demos to me and I listened to it and then I said, well, maybe you'd like my friend Wendy, she plays bass and guitar, and maybe you'd like her to play on it too. And they were like, oh, well, uh, we'd like to meet your friend. <laughs> you know, it, was, it turned, it was actually really funny because they knew everything and I was acting like they knew nothing. <laughs> <laughs> um, but we just decided it, there's, there was something about it that was just really, um, raw and emotional and it just sounded like let's just do it 
Why not? We did it in seven day, six days. Wow. Yeah, and um, it was such a beautiful experience. Oh my God. First of all, I just say, and she, Allison knows this, and so does all the women involved in the project. I was dreading, dreading it, because I had never been in a room with only female musicians. Wow. And I know from past experiences, a lot of female musicians have a lot to prove. And when they're in a recording studio, they can get a little bit highfalutin. <laughs> and I am so not that person at all. So I don't like the competition amongst women, which can happen a lot. So I was under the assumption that that might happen. And I am telling you, it was one of the best experiences I have ever had. It was, I mean, Al Allison calls it a rainbow coalition. And it was the most magical meeting of musicians. And we just played these songs in six days. And Allison came in and sang these. It just couldn't have been a better time. And we've just never regretted one moment of it. It's, she's absolutely the real deal. Her songwriting, her story, Everything about that woman is for real. It's unbelievable. And the record came out last year? Yeah, her yeah. second record came out last year. Okay, awesome, that's a great question. Next, yes sir. Hi, my name is Jahi. And first I wanna say thank you so much for the music. And uh, my question is about partnership. And the music business is littered with failed partnerships. Everybody's story who you hear in the music business has a central failed partnership that is the departure for either what happens or doesn't happen for them. You've had several versions of partnership over your whole lifetime. Do you, what do you think is the key to the success and the failures of the different types of partnerships that the both of you have had? Well, um, in a word, love, you know, it's just, when you love somebody, it, it, it'll change, the relationship will change. I mean, even with being in love with somebody and, you know, and you have fights and you grow different ways and, you know, but you can always love that person. You know, once you really loved them, I, I believe, that never goes away. And Wendy and I have been able to get through a lot of difficult times, but we always go back to like, you know, but I really love, I love you. And I love the way that she thinks. I, I love the way she plays, you know, and, and you, if you, we're still able to um, share like the best of ourselves with each other. So if you kind of like, aim high and, and be your best self, um, you'll be doing yourself a, a great favor, you know, and just always remember you love that person. That's all I can say. Yeah. <laughs> that was your, your turn to just say, yeah, this time, or you have more. I, I think. I, I'll add one thing that I have always believed that the two of us have a tremendous amount of respect for each other. And I love everything she does, and I, I too love the way she thinks. And I frankly am very quite selfish with my attachment to her. She's my secret weapon. <laughs> yeah, Wendy's my favorite band. <laughs> you guys. Next. Let's have cake. I know, what are we doing now? Hi. It's really hard to follow that. Um, <laughs> hi, my name is Joanna. Um, thank you so much for coming and speaking. It's been really, really awesome just to hear about your different experiences. Um, specifically, what really stuck out to me is just hearing about how you're on tour at 19 and also later having to break off and do your own work and trying to kind of 
create your own uh, sound and just kind of be true to yourselves. Uh, my question is just kind of knowing all that you know now, what is one thing that you would tell yourself at 19? Especially as women in the industry, you kind of touched on it about there's uh, just kind of subconscious competition and kind of having to rebrand yourself to be appealing and entertaining to the public. So what would you tell yourself at 19 that I guess can also be applied to young women musicians now? What I would say to myself at 19 then is different than if I was 19 right now. So let's just say if I was turning 19 right now in today's day and age, I would do everything I could to learn how to write a good song. I just would. And not, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be so concerned with branding myself. I would enmesh myself in listening to everything. I would fall in love with storytelling and I would try try my best to write a great song. And that's it. That, that's what I would tell a 19-year-old right now. Uh, and I, I would add to that that, in my opinion, a great song is when you connect with yourself and you don't worry about you know, writing a great hook or a great you know, pop thing. You, you want to really be connecting with yourself and you can have that imaginary audience in your head and everything but if if you aren't moving your own emotions then it's not going to be a great song it might be a good song but... <laughs> thank you thank you that's an amazing answer last call for questions because if not we are going to have to wrap this conversation up i wish we did not but um, please, uh, again, thank you to Jason and everyone involved with creating this beautiful evening. Thank you for spending your Friday night here on the USC campus. Um, and, you know. Thank you. Oh. Yay, thank you. Timothy, Timothy and Burnside. <laughs> she is quite amazing. <laughs> I have to say you both, you do make it easy and I appreciate you embracing my just like peak nerdiness um, so many times. Uh, but thank you so much for spending time with us and engaging. Um, we're, we're grateful that, that you're here and maybe this will not be your last PopCon appearance. Thank you. Maybe not. So with that, we will say thank you so much again for, for coming. And um, we'll see you tomorrow at the conference. Yeah. Thanks, guys.